on magazines. And uh, they were they were happy to take him to the nice place. So he didn't just use one, one agency. Fly him with cognac. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And he was happy to take it too. <laughs> He, no, he, well, he, he, he used uh, several different ones, and he went Lord and he, Lord and Thomas was one, Lord and Thomas, and and uh, but he, uh, he he told me uh, he says I he says I bought he says the highest priced copywriters thought the best recommended the the people who were the the, the doyens of the industry went to, to try our account. And he says, I found that I could write ads that work better than they could for my product. And so he said, I, he says, some of those lines, he says, I wrote this line, uh, uh, Night or Day at Work or Play, which has a little suggestion of sexual happiness in it. And he says, I wrote that in the, he says, of the days of Theodore Roosevelt. He says, this still works. And it, 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 I, we were using it when it closed. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I look through those ad books, and they're just there are a jillion different ads. Yeah. You know, and I and and uh, they tried them a lot. Of them. Well, they tried them in all, all the different magazines, but they kept trying the, the, the different ads to see which ads would would produce better than another ad. Right. They tried matchbooks. They tried free rulers. Uh, they tried all kinds of little premium knickknacks. You've seen some of them. Around and not too many survived little calendars and uh, sure, sure. Uh, but <clears throat> now I don't know what, what are we talking about. We want to talk about how the business worked uh, because the, there's there's some interesting stuff about well, sure the, the, the dirty little secret. Not so little is it that half of the new customers never reordered. And they like to make people think that it's one big happy family. Once they get one, they're they're on cloud nine, and they're gonna. Well, but the, the, there was also a cure rate. Infinitesimal. Uh, there were there were there were uh, you know uh, what was it a uh, hundred thousand cures or something a, a, a documented letters of cure. And uh, this is out of a sales of 14 million appliances. So it wasn't the normal thing that somebody would be cured by. It wasn't a normal thing that wouldn't write to say that they were. On the other hand, <clears throat> some of the people were hypochondriacs who never had Ernie in the first place. Okay, sure. And it just isn't, you know, isn't but it's, <clears throat> it's also clear if you go over the cure letters uh, that Usually, the cure involved a growing body, a young person, a child, or maybe a young adult whose body was still growing and the, and the muscle walls would grow okay. back over right. the intestines okay. after the right. intestines were held gently. <laughs> Yet, <laughs> firmly. <laughs> yeah, gently. Gently. Yeah. <laughs> gently, yeah. Yet, firmly. So, uh, and another thing that happened was that uh, people would wear it, would wear it for uh, maybe two or three of them, and then have an operation. Oh, I don't want those stinking, yeah, dirt, well, and smelly, the uh, sweaty things. When, you when, know, when after did, a while, they, when did people start getting operations for hernias? I mean, all they the way. didn't get those, Larry, until the fifties and sixties. Well, it depends on it who, who you were or how much money you had. Well, yeah, but it was, I remember if somebody was having surgery, that was a well, thing. Well, life or death? Yeah, uh, the way, one way that it, uh, it changed radically, the business changed radically, was the advent of health insurance and uh, prepaid medical, medical operations. Uh, when they were in their heyday, when they were first started, almost nobody there was no such thing as a pre-employment physical examination. Uh, and by the time we died, there was no such thing as a job without one, you know. And so that when the hernia was discovered, well, you, these people won't hire you until you have that repaired, came up. And they, they didn't have, but in their heyday, uh, also, the, uh, the customers 
although it always was an old man's thing, but the customers tended to cover the whole age spectrum more than they did at the end where we had nothing but old people at the end, practically. So, and the young people haven't even heard of an alternative now to surgery. Well, yeah, well, M M's lawyer in Jackson said, oh, he says, I've got a, he says, I haven't been in the hospital since I was 14. He says, I've got to go in for a, a hernia surgery. And yeah. I said, oh, I know something about those. Okay. And uh, he said, oh, it, he said, it, why, it, it, uh, it's searing pain. I said, yep, I, all I could think of was with the guy in, in the press. <laughs> Someone's screwing the, screwing the press, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. But the remarkable thing is the Brooks Appliance, nobody, nobody ever said it made their hernia worse except a couple of schmucks in New York who were just obviously uh, looking for deep pockets to sue or something. But it was, out of all the millions of people who wore them, they, they obviously never harmed anybody or, or they, they, the government would have come down on them like a ton of bricks. And uh, they, they, they were enjoined by the New Deal. Uh, their advertising had to change. They had to stop using the word cure. They had to stop using the word remedy. Stop using the word heal. Uh, there was a long, long list of, of things they couldn't do anymore. But it didn't. It, and it did uh, crimp their style a little bit in the response to the ads, but but not uh, terribly significantly. They had, by that time they were established and had a good reputation. And there's a lot of recommendation by word of mouth. There were a lot of there were a lot of letters that were pre-printed letters in different languages, but they weren't for overseas use. They were for use. They were for different neighborhoods in the United States that didn't speak English: Polish, Lithuanian, or Dutch. Uh, uh, you know, Spanish. So some someone someone had Italian. had to discern when the letter came in from the last yeah. name and. Yeah. The, in the area that they lived in? Perhaps. Grandpa said he had uh, people around Marshall uh, who, who were fluent in different languages he, that he would call once in a while when they got something like that in the mail. And there were, there, upstairs in the third the floor there, there were, there were uh, great big bins up there that said, yeah. for the, for the uh, printed brochures, I've got those too that are done in Dutch and Latvian and yeah. Czechoslovakia. They had little form books and the, the girls would type the follow-up letters <laughs> copying the foreign language even though they didn't understand it, you know. This is the third letter when they haven't bought. And, and it would go to some German area in St. Louis or something. It was good enough that, they, that the customer could understand it. It reminded me of something else and I forgot what it was. It'll, it'll come back up. Yeah. The, um, Lewin, Lewin Zo. And Harold and oh Tom Gladys, and Chuck no Gladys all went to England at the same time yes in 1910 and then okay. he, neither Tom or Chuck were born there were they in England Alex was okay. their sister Alex right. my mother's That's age right. yeah sure and uh, Alex Brooks was born just about the same time as my mother but I don't think she was born in England I think uh, I think. Uh, Will and his wife came back. Did they come back earlier than than uh, Grandpa? I think so. Did? Yeah. And Grandpa said he was always going. When they were over there, he was always at the antique stores, and do, do following his own muse, you know. And H. C. was running the show at the office. Okay. But the, you know, H. C. In all fairness to Lou, uh, uh, nobody could work with him. And. Uh, if he if he wanted to do it by himself, he he, he was rather a perfectionist. Let him do it. it seemed to be you yep. know, Lou's attitude. I don't blame him. He go scout out and try various violins, and he did buy one there. Uh, Lou knew his antiques very well. They say he, he was quite quite knowledgeable about antiques and interested in them. Uh, Lou was also a charming man who was who was very popular, and uh, he was elected mayor of Marshall before Grandpa, you know. He was, he was a lot like Grandpa. He liked to drink. And, uh, but but, uh, but he, the, the Grandpa uh, didn't quite go 
completely over the line the way Lou did, and Grandpa would, would you know, be back in church the next Sunday as the vestry and uh, treasurer and so on, which which Lou couldn't quite do. <laughs> Grandpa used to used to carve himself out uh, uh, little budgets for ten days or twenty days or twenty one days in Florida, and it would be uh, you know ten thousand dollars or something. And that's what they'd spend, and the doorman would get 20, and the, everything was just high, white, and handsome for three weeks. And he'd come back home and say, turn those lights out, don't you think money grows on trees? He was a <laughs> schizoid that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Big spender. And, but uh, as my mother said, she said, you know, he'd go to the, the uh, what was the name of the hotel in Paris he always went to? It was the same one Elizabeth Taylor goes to. It's like, I've got the, I've it's got, like the Pierre in New York. I've got the letter. I've got the letter that Grandpa wrote to Elizabeth Taylor that he didn't. He ran into her in the elevator, some something or other. And went, yeah. Went up and penned this letter. Yeah. And um, and there there it is. You know, yeah. but I, he didn't ever send it to her. No. Well, he he said uh, that. Uh, or my mother said that. He'd go to those places he hadn't been there for 20 years in the dorm and say, Mr. Brooks, how have you been? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Oh. Duck away from Elizabeth and greet Harold. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what that's what he really enjoyed, that sort of thing. Which, uh, of course, any anybody in the entertainment business knows those people do enjoy that. Look, nobody's better at it than Wynn Schuller. <clears throat> So, and that's well, that was also the point, I guess, of having the same itinerary on every European jaunt. It, it was always the, uh, the you know, the the, uh, the same hotel, and it was always the Savoy in London, uh, the, this one in Paris, and there's another one in Switzerland, or wherever he went every time. I was, I was talking to my mother, and uh, somehow it came up. She said, "Oh well." She said someone at Brooks Appliance tried to start talking about forming a union. And she said, Graham, Graham fired him, just, just there. Yeah. And she gave me the gal's name, too. I got to make sure I don't throw Well, it. you know, it was a velvet glove, but there was a male fist there, too. And uh, hey, he had it, and uh, people like Bud didn't. And my mother, you know, he, he was really out there in the real world defending him all his life, even when he was 90 years old, he was he was keeping the, the swindlers away and stuff. He was a little shrewder than his children, I think. But he was a very shrewd hombre. Well, yeah, I mean, I only ever saw for, him. For a, a little country boy, and I always, <clears throat> I always thought, you know, he, he, would, he would wax uh, reminiscent about how the world had changed since he was a kid. And, there was no telephone, there was no Bay Road, there was no automobile, there was no aeroplane, there was no television. There were none of these, all these things had come in, in his lifetime. And uh, it used to be a, an hour or something on the buckboard to go to Battle Creek at least. And you had to rent a hack or, or, get, your, or get your train tickets and get the schedule out. And, uh, you know, going to, going to Albion was an event. And this, I think this tended to make people uh, who were bright uh, focus more intensively on their own townsfolk and on the people in their own village or, or town or uh, school or neighborhood. They, they, there was there was a, a it turned people in to to um, bringing more skill to their relations with their neighbors and their and the people they're dealing with and it, it made it made, it gave them they, they used to say a peasant shrewdness about the dealing with people and and they do if you notice they have it people who have been in some little microcosm in the Ukraine all their lives or something will, will have a lot of smarts about human nature and things that, that somebody who's more cosmopolitan <coughs> had other things to amuse himself with and then judging what people's reaction would be if you were less than uh, fulsome in your praise or thanks or, 
if you're yeah mean to studying the human nature rather than the yeah and uh, grandpa well, grandpa was very very shrewd uh, in uh, how he dealt with people and made when he wanted to make a good impression he could be he could be extremely ingratiating if he wanted to be and he didn't always want to be but when he wanted to be and they they think boy he was a nice guy after they left him you know <clears throat> well, a little a little suspecting what a calculating son of a bitch he really was. <laughs> well, I like the story about the stamps on the line. Just uh, yeah. two weeks ago, uh, John um, wrote that, uh, Collins wrote that article about Grandpa in the trees down, downtown. You know, yeah. the, the, one, the one project that he'd failed at, that he couldn't get the mm -hmm. okay on. And uh, how, and I thought, yeah, well, he knew exactly who had voted for the trees and who voted against them by them, yeah. putting those stamps on the letters. Sure, yeah. you know. <laughs> Tilting them a little bit. And this one's half an inch from the edge. This yeah. one's a quarter of an inch. Yeah, yeah wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, but, okay, uh, Jenny, if you want to get on. I remember one year when his old age, uh, he, he said to me at uh, one point, he says, you know, I'm proud of one of the few people alive that's paid income tax every year since there's been one because he was making good money at a tender age in 1913 or whatever the first year. It only hit people making over 10000 a year, which was the moon then, oh, you know. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, but, but anyway, I was trying to explain to him that since he, Goodbye. Since he sold this London stock to his children uh, for the same amount that he paid, that, that the liquidating dividend was or something or other, that since there was no gain or loss, it didn't have to go on his return at all. And they, or whatever it was, and it wasn't that wonderful, so we just leave it right off and everything is fine, you know. And he couldn't quite understand it. And I went over and over and over, and I said, well, Grandpa, just trust me, just sign it. I said, it's it's legal. And it's well, this is 75. Is, huh? This is 75, right? 1975? Well, something like that. Yeah. I don't know. Because he died. Well, I, I said, I said, you know, this is this is ter terribly sophisticated. I said, you don't have to understand. It. Just sign it. It's okay. And he looked at me. He says, I understand lots of things that are sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> funny. Oh, funny sometimes. I remember one day, he, you know, he used to measure out four dollars and eleven cents, and he wanted a half. A uh, pint of Old Taylor 100 proof, and it was four dollars and eleven cents. And you never buy a case; you always had to get somebody to get one once in a while, you know, like every other day. <laughs> and uh, I got Harry finally oh to put a dozen of them in his desk down there. And when, when he Harry he'd stand at the top, Harry go running upstairs, and I want to get me some groceries and give him four dollars and eleven cents, you know. All right, sir, once he'd run down the door and out the door, and all of them walk up the straight to Hemmingson's and get the booze and come back. And meanwhile, he, he was uh, running the whole business downstairs, and he had other things to do. And I said, all right, here, I said, get, I'll get 15 of them. And he just run downstairs on that deal, allow a suitable time, and then run upstairs with the bottle, and it'll come out fine. <laughs> and so he did. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, one day he, one day he wanted me, I was living at the house, it was probably in the late 60s, and uh, he wanted me to go to Hemmingson's and get him some shaving cream, and it had to be Gillette Foamy, no menthol, or, you know, he told me exactly what it was because he'd been burned with the wrong kind at some point. <coughs> and and he, so he told me, too many times, and he told me about four times during breakfast. He wanted me to do that for him today. And so I went down there and did it. And when he came home that night, it was on his black table there in the kitchen, it was his his can of Gillette and foamy, with whatever it was. And uh, I'm out in the living room watching television. <clears throat> and he comes home, and hangs up his coat, and goes out in the kitchen, and there in the paper bag was his stuff. <clears throat> and he comes storming out to the living room. And he stands in the door of the living room and says, You got the wrong thing, you know. I said, Grandpa, you told me foamy Gillette, no, 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 no menthol. And he says, 
holds it up. He says, yes. But this says new, improved with K34. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he laughs. That's the only one they had, Grandpa. <laughs> when do they move on from above him, or from above uh, uh, the drugstore there? The, when did, uh, 1911. Or when did they buy? 1908. They bought the, the building. Okay. Yeah. I think it was 1908. Did they use the, the Did they use the whole building then? No, no. You know, they had uh, they they had a, a cigar factory in there. And the Statesman newspaper. I think the Statesman was gone by the time Brooks bought it. Uh, they bought it on a time contract. They didn't buy it outright, and they collected rent for four or five years when they first bought it from the other tenants. Be one by one, they kicked them out, and the place had been a hotel. Mm -hmm. It started out as a Dibble Dry Goods. Um, what, what do you call it? Uh, Clothing? Well, um, the general merchandise uh, yeah. kind of stores that they had in the 19th century they don't anymore. It was, yeah, it was, it was a department store. Department store. And uh, then they remodeled. They, what, I think in 1912, that's what it says over the door, right? They, they remodeled the facade in 1912. To make it look like the bank building on yeah. the yeah. yeah, much to the horror of, of preservationists now, who like the look of the old wooden, original look of the, the windows in the front. Uh, and there are only a, a couple of tangential photos that uh, survive of, of how that looked. I think the stereoptic in slide maybe shows it at a great distance. Well, there's the, the one, the drawing, that, that, I, that came up with the stuff you gave me. It's a, it's a, a sketch of it. Oh. There are a couple as of the, photos. Here's the double block. Well, you've seen the one with C.E. standing in front with his thumbs hooked in his vest when, and a big 10-gallon uh, hat standing on the left. There's the Brooks Appliance Company and staff in front of the building. The only ones you recognize, or you wouldn't recognize, Uncle Pete was there, and uh, Grandpa, maybe Lou, I'm not sure. But it was 1909 or so, in front, right after the, right before the remodeling. Okay. Well, they, they remodeled it after they came back from England. So that must have been 1912 yeah, or 13. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in fact, it does resemble the building they were in in England. It might have inspired the well, might choice have, of architecture. Might. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a clone. Yeah, I, I never thought of that. You're right. Oh, geez, yeah. that's a yeah, that's a it's a clone of that building in England. It just absolutely. Yeah. And then the, when they put the addition on the back. Oh, it was about 1930, 32. It was right around 32, 33. They just they just were bursting at the seams. So, and and Grandpa was worried about the fire. And all these customer records, it's hundreds of thousands of customers' records, and uh, how well, disastrous it would be if they were lost. So, if you've ever noticed, the addition is all reinforced concrete and, and utterly fireproof. And they went to extra expense, so uh, they put in the sprinkler system too to give them that peace of mind. And they never did have a fire, they might have. Yeah, well, it's all wood, yeah, and everybody smoked. Well, the, they weren't the employees couldn't smoke except for Pearl and Grandpa, and the rest of them all, all were hiding in the bathroom when they were smoking. Right to the day that I got there, which was July '75, they, nobody in the place could smoke except oh, yeah. Grandpa and Pearl. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Which, uh, and some of them, like Ina's, their fingers were all yellow. She was a she was a chain smoker, but uh, she did it on the sly. All. Margaret Faust was always chasing her out of the bathroom. But those people, I tell you, they, 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 they tended to stay for decades and decades. They were happy with their, with their uh, measly uh, wages and benefits down there. Well, they must not have been too easily, or Grandpa gave them something at the end of the year. Or the working conditions were very pleasant, were always very pleasant. There were, there were always, uh, uh, they were, there was always uh, uh, rapport with each other. They were the same kind of people. They, they were, they always got along pretty happily with each other. There's a lot to be said for that. And there, 
And it was a kind of business where if somebody had to take off suddenly, uh, the world wasn't going to come to an end. They just filled the mail order the next week, you know. That you yeah. had to wait for Lawrence to make a special cushion a few days. It didn't matter. And, and so, that, so they had a certain flexibility there when, when they had a medical problem or uh, you know, a dentist appointment or something. They, they could come and go more easily than a, than a Ford Motor Company. They, so there were there were some compensations uh, for the low pay and lack of uh, benefits. They didn't own no benefits at all, hardly. <clears throat> and certainly no pensions and no no medical until very late years. But the, the thing changed too. The equation changed. Uh, uh, the the uh, how important was the was the personnel cost? And how important was the product cost? And what what was the Price you're getting, you could get for the appliance, and uh, the, the whole, the whole thing uh, 